get started in a couple of minutes. Appreciate you hanging out. Matter of fact, we might just go ahead and get started. What do you say? Stop the screen share. Turn off this extra noise. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome. Definitely appreciate everyone showing up. Uh, if you're watching this on replay, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Appreciate you guys showing up. Uh, my name is Lewis Conway Jr. We're doing this every Wednesday night, late night at the ledge. Um, some of you may have seen my postings. If you haven't, you should go ahead and follow me on Instagram. Follow me on, I'm, I'm really more active on LinkedIn. I apologize. I'm not as active on Facebook as I should be, and I promise I will be. Um, but you can definitely find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram, Lewis Conway Jr. All right. And so kind of backing up and giving you some, some, some landscaping as, as to what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and, um, give me some history as well. Pardon me for drinking, y'all. I apologize. I, my name is Louis Conway Jr. As I said, I'm only incarcerated. I did eight years in prison. I did 12 years on parole. And while I was on parole, I had difficulty finding employment. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was probably the, the largest struggle because employment was the key to housing. It was the key to health care. And, you know, not having employment was a huge barrier in my reintegration. And so as I tried to reintegrate and as I tried to, um, you know, normalize myself after prison, not being able to find employment was a huge barrier, you know, and folks coming out of prison, you know, we don't have the same options or the same opportunities as other folks when it comes to employment. And, you know, for some people, employment isn't a big thing. And, you know, some of the guys that I went to prison with, employment wasn't a big thing. Um, they were able to come out of prison and get jobs. And the reason why I'm kind of foot stomping employment is, is because that's what got me activated um, doing advocacy, right? There was a fair chance hiring opportunity in Austin, where we were going to follow the federal fair chance um, hiring pledge that Obama had asked uh, corporations to sign. And we wrote that dovetail and we were able to pass a local ordinance that forbade private employers from doing a background check prior to an interview or even prior to hiring. As a matter of fact, um, you know, we went so far as to demand that you would have to offer a con additional job offer before you get a background check. And our reasoning was you know, we shouldn't be doing background checks on folks you're not going to hire anyway, um, but you shouldn't be doing background checks in the first place in terms of qualifying someone. Um, but there's, there's nuances and contours to that, and, and that's not the point. The point is, is that what got me involved after not even – you know, realizing that there was an avenue of engagement was I was able to connect a life experience with advocacy. And oftentimes I think that that's where we miss the boat or we miss the plane is that we, we engage people in the latter aspects of advocacy, but we really don't explain to them why advocacy is important you know, what position that they actually play and, you know, involving folks in the actual ideation of campaigns, bring folks in on policy conversations. You know, I came into this work literally out of the strip club. Funny story is when we first began to meet uh, second chance Democrats and we were beginning to put together a strategy to pass this ordinance, um, you know, people were talking about a Google Doc. Now, mind you, I spent 10 years as a strip club DJ, so Google Docs and Google Drives really weren't how, how I operated. And 
and I kept waiting on a phone call. I kept waiting on people, you know, we were going to jump on the phone and, and have this conversation. And I, and I would get this email that said people shared something with me. And I was like, nobody has shared anything with me. I've been waiting on folks to share something. And, you know, as, as smart as I thought I was and as, as oriented as I thought I was to software, I had never used um, Google Docs before. And I was too ashamed to tell people that I didn't know how to use Google Docs. And so, you know, for a couple of three weeks, I was really, really looped out because I was too afraid to tell folks I was too ashamed. Also, I was afraid I was ashamed to tell people that I didn't know how to use Google Docs. And what that meant was there was a conversation happening about strategy, happening about the campaign that I couldn't weigh in on. And so when I talk about legislative advocacy, I'm going to get really, really pedantic for some. I'm going to be really, really redundant for some because I want to make sure that we don't miss folks. Um, I don't want to assume anything. You know, there are people who come into advocacy that don't have a political science degree, don't have the experience of working on a campaign, you know, don't have someone that they've been able to intern for. Again, I came into this work straight out the strip club and, and I was doing it for free. And I think sometimes we don't appreciate just how much free means to people who don't have much, right? And I didn't have a whole lot then, but making sure nobody went through what I went through for 12 years on parole, that was the fuel that made me drive across town on fumes make sure I was able to show up to these meetings, all right? So let's get to it. What is legislative advocacy? Well, legislative advocacy is primarily pushing elected officials to act, right? And what that means is oftentimes bills are passed at night while you're asleep, while you're at work. And the only way for you to really influence that process is to get to that person, that, that, that lawmaker. Um, and that comes in different ways, and we'll talk about the mechanics of that. But I want to lean into what advocacy is. You know, um, advocacy is really the connective tissue that brings the power to the people. Right? The only way for your community to be informed about certain laws and measures and ordinances is that somebody has to inform them. Somebody has to be engaged. Somebody has to go to you know, that door, that block, and tell somebody, well, that's advocating. And that comes in many different forms and for many different reasons. But in this sense, we're talking about using the legislative process to advocate for or against harmful or beneficial um, laws, ordinances. Um, and, and again, it doesn't just happen at the state house or the assembly house or the Capitol. It happens um, with city councils. Um, it happens, um, you know, at the county uh, court. It happens not just on a state level, federal level. And, and, and the reason why I'm, I'm kind of being careful here is because the process is the same and I don't want you to get lost in the nuances. I want you to really, you know, just like when you're playing a ball, you know, it's like that crossover, you're doing that crossover over and over and over and over before you even try to pull it out in a game. And so that's why I really want to lean into the basis. And so, there are different types of, of advocacy. One way to get involved is that there's a bill that creates new spending. Now, that's where we really have to get engaged because as we're talking about this defund and refund talk, um, we're talking about passing bills that's going to determine the way money is being spent fiscally and the way that these departments or these agencies are gonna be able to use um, public funds. Well. Oftentimes, we can curtail 
the impact of these agencies by attacking their budget. And the way we do that is through a bill that will create or decrease some spending. Now, another um, way to advocate is legislation that speaks to a particular philosophy or will, or will legitimize your issue. For instance, reentry is a very broad subject. And when we talk about reentry, what first comes to people's minds is services. We don't really think about you know, employment. We don't think about housing. We don't think about healthcare. We don't think about fathering. We don't think about buying a home. We don't think about all the things that really you know, make up what it means to live in the free world. And when we're talking about reentry, we're always talking about post-incarceration, but really reentry begins before you even leave prison. Well, to effectively address reentry, there are certain um, components that we need to address. Licensing, for instance. There are over 250 licenses in Texas, for instance, that folks are not allowed to have based upon a conviction. Now, those professional licenses oftenly disproportionately attack or impact people of color. You know, a cosmetology license, you know, a barber license. You know, we're not allowed you know, to have an HVAC license. We're not allowed to be master electricians. Anything that might, you know, and, and what brought this really what bubbled up for me when this happened was I was um, volunteering at a reentry center and the owner of the center was trying to hire someone, but that person had a background. And because that person had a background, they couldn't be a cook. They weren't doing anything but trying to be a cook and trying to stay out of prison, but because they had been convicted of a violent crime, they couldn't be around with honorable populations. Now, I mean, if you know, and if you don't know, I was convicted of a violent crime. I was uh, convicted of voluntary manslaughter. And what that means is oftentimes I was precluded an opportunity before I was even interviewed. And the reason why I'm honing in on this is because were it not for us passing an ordinance, my background would have always been a barrier. Now, Right after we passed that municipal ordinance, there was a state lawmaker that decided to try to pass a state bill that would stop any city in Texas from passing that type of, uh, of ordinance. Well, that meant we suddenly had to become state advocates on a state level, rather, when we had just learned how to navigate the city process. And this is why I tell you information is power. Information is the new power. Um, knowledge is the new power. And we had a lot of passion and some of us were aware, but not everyone was. And had everyone had the kind of information, the kind of um, grounding in the legislative process, we could have been more effective. And so that's what I'm trying to do now. Moving forward in the next couple of years, we're going to be battling voter rights. We're going to be battling gerrymandering. We're going to be battling folks trying to uh, make sure uh, punishments are harsher. And what that means, we're going to have to get smarter when it comes to organizing. We're going to have to get smarter when it comes to advocating. And we're going to have to bring directly impacted people in closer and sooner when we build these campaigns if we want to be effective, all right? Now, a law or policy that aligns with your own personal political beliefs or will benefit your target audience is another way for you to advocate, right? So when we talk about healthcare for all, you know, we're specifically targeting a population that obviously is in need of healthcare. When we talk about immigration laws, we're obviously targeting a population that has been uh, discriminated against just trying to come to America and change their lives. Well, one way to advocate for that group of people is to go to that lawmaker with a piece of legislation. And, and I apologize, if you're trying to contact me, please just text me. I, I put a phone number um, in the description because I haven't figured out how to do the Facebook thing yet and Zoom at the same time. So anyway, that's what's up on that. Um, one of those ways to advocate is through a law or policy that uh, benefits a certain group. More often than not, we're talking about 
people of color. We're talking about poor people. We're talking about communities that have historically been disenfranchised. Those communities are, are the communities that need advocates. And those communities are the ones that are furthest from the process. Definitely not even understanding the process and not really realizing their power. And that's one of the tools that when I say they, I'm talking about people that want to keep folks disengaged in order to pass laws that keep folks disengaged. I know it sounds like a conundrum, but that's what happens. Um, another way to advocate is, as, as, as you heard me talking from the top, an act of local legislation that supports your cause. Um, one of the ways that I'm finding out is the most effective, and you heard me touch on it earlier, was budget advocacy. Budget advocacy is a sophisticated way for us to really attack the systematic truths. Now, it's my belief that as long as there is an incentive to incarcerate folks, we're going to continue to incarcerate folks. And that incentive is economic, you know, based upon the, the, the growth of the prison, uh, not just populations, but prisons themselves. Those prisons have sustained, revitalized rural communities all across America. And what that means is we have decided that locking people up is a business practice that is worth us investing billions into. Well, I submit that that practice has done more to our communities in, in terms of destroying futures, in terms of destroying families, and in, in terms of extinguishing the brightest lights in our communities, all for a dollar. Well, budget advocacy allows us to use that same kind of mentality, that same strategy, against them. You know, we were able to close four prisons in Texas using budget advocacy. Uh, when you ever you hear about a private prison being closed, whenever you hear about a correctional facility being closed, it's always because someone employed budget advocacy as a tactic. And it's one of the most powerful ways to bring the community in, but it's also a good way for us to translate the power of the people, right? Now, um, one of the best ways for us to employ legislative advocacy is broad policy, theoretical, or moral support. You know, when we ask for our champions to get behind the bill, we got to make sure that champion or that sponsor has some buy-in. It's got to have some skin in the game. You know, oftentimes you we capitulate when we're in these committee hearings and we capitulate uh, when they offer up amendments because we don't want to press for that hard envelope. And oftentimes that hard envelope means that we're not carving out people with violent convictions, that we're not carving out folks with sex offenses, that we're not carving out folks that uh, you know may have harmed someone in the act. And that may make the negotiations harder and that may make our angle you know a bit more narrow but the transformational change over time is worth the effort and whoever we're getting to sponsor our bills that's where the, the advocacy comes in that's where you got to sit down with them and share your story um you know you're bringing that person into the community you're doing listening sessions you're inviting that lawmaker to come and sit in those public housing forums, you're asking them to come and sit in those churches and you're asking the community to talk to that lawmaker and tell them what you need and what you want. That's part of advocacy, right? So why should I be bothered? Well, people are experts in their own conditions. That's why you should be bothered. Like there, there's no other way for a lawmaker to know that that pothole outside your grandmother's home is causing her issues that keeps her in the hospital because she doesn't know who to complain to. When I first started this work, I was really focused on criminal justice issues. And then I ran for office and I realized that there's taxes, there's healthcare, um, there's roads. And all of that makes up what 
should be your why. Your community is depending upon voices within the community to talk to those lawmakers and have them understand the needs of the community because everyone can't show up. And that's, and that's almost purposeful, right? It's almost purposeful that they create these forums, they create the hearings in a, such a way that, you know, most folks have to work during those hours. You know, most folks don't get paid to show up and testify, right? Now, another reason why you should be bothered by legislative advocacy is you don't always have a choice. Like, there's no other way for us and I don't want to be controversial, I'm just going to be real. There's no other way for us to stop cops from killing unarmed Black men if we don't legislate. There's no other way. The, the cost for killing a Black man isn't high enough. And it's not high enough because we haven't passed the right laws that cause them to be held accountable to a level to where there's a discouragement, there's a deterrent mm -hmm. to killing unarmed black men. And the only way for us to do that is to uh, employ legislative advocacy. All right, now, the other way is that you have to court attention. The only way for us to get these laws passed, the only way for us to bring attention to issues, black lives matter, would not have mattered if they didn't court the attention, right? Um, this, this is, I wanna say today, is uh, when we celebrate uh, women's suffrage, they use legislative advocacy in a way that you would not imagine. Um, and maybe I'll do a piece on that when it talks about advocacy. The women's suffrage movement, those women were very, very um, aggressive and persuasive in getting their right to vote. And it was about drawing attention to their issue, right? now. Another reason why you, you need to be involved in legislative advocacy is because the media, especially now, has a way of determining how we see things. It, it has a way, the media has a way of kind of shaping our thinking. And the only way to counter that is through legislative advocacy. Um, that's the only way for us to counter bad press is to get into that lawmaker's office um, get into his ear get into his mind into his heart and the only way to do that again is to advocacy now most importantly um you know you don't want to miss a chance to help change your community you don't want to miss a chance helping folks create a better condition I've always said that people deserve to live in the best conditions possible. And people are experts in their own conditions. So people know what they need to live the best quality, the best version of their lives. And, and, and the only way for us to do that is to make sure lawmakers are in tune and they have their pulse, their, their, their thumb on the pulse of what folks need. And you the advocate, you the organizer, you the organization, you know, we are the ones, we are that connective tissue that bring the power to the people. And without that connective tissue, there really is no way for us to imbue the type of, of fortitude that allows people to stand up to a lawmaker and say, you know what, that law hurts my family and you can't pass it, All right? All right, so, when should you get up off your chair, get up off your couch and get engaged? Well, if you're tuning in tonight, you decided that you want to be engaged. Um, most folks wait until something happens when there's an attack on an honorable group. You know, Black folks been getting killed by cops as far back. Um, you know, you can go all the way back uh, to the inception of policing post-slavery. But it didn't become an issue until legislative advocacy. Black Lives Matter. Um, there were several incidents where we were able to to legislate in the '90s and in the '80s that impacted the way uh, policing. I'm, I'm not saying it helped. I'm just saying that that was one of the ways we addressed it. 
Another time for you to get up off your couch is when the ruling party um, wins, you know, when, when there was a lot of opposition to people's rights, when there was a lot of opposition to immigration rights, when there was a lot of opposition to the equality rights, when there was a lot of opposition, um, you know, to folks being treated as humans, there was a ruling party in power. Well, when that ruling party is out of power, that's when you get up off your couch. That's when it's time to get busy, right? Um, because you only have a couple of years, a couple of cycles before that variable can change. Now, another good time is when you've already passed legislation, because that means folks are going to want to come back and try it again. But that's tricky, though. Because oftentimes we only want to do the easy, the easy work. You know, when we talked about fair chance hiring, we didn't talk about fair chance housing because we felt like that would muddy the waters. But in reality, what good is employment without housing? Because you can't maintain employment without housing and vice versa. So I think it's really important that when we think about after we pass a piece of legislation and our sponsor and our champion or our community wants to pass something that's just like that, we have to be careful and always be willing to push the envelope. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, another time to get involved is when you know somebody who is just as impacted, right? Um, again, my wife, really had no intention <laughs> in getting involved in politics. My wife had no intention in becoming a housing advocate. But when we moved to Austin and she was with me, when we encountered the no's, when we encountered the denials for housing, that forced her into a position to become an advocate. So sometimes you don't all, again, you don't have a choice and life will put you in a position to have to be an advocate. So why not just go ahead and, and you know what's going on around you. You know what your community is, is hurting for. Wherever you are in America, you know what deficits are happening in your schools. You know what's happening. Um, you, you drive over that, 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 that pothole you just don't know who to talk to. And that's what we're here to help you do. Now, um, we're gonna do this every Wednesday. And I'm, again, I'm gonna be redundant and I'm gonna be very, very pedantic when it comes to really nailing down what legislative advocacy is, what it can do. Next week, we're gonna talk about um, the process because the process is different in different arenas, but the process is the same. I, I often tell people it's like riding a bike. It's the same, it just depends on where you're doing it. Riding a bike on a street is not the same as mountain biking, but the mechanics are the same, right? So same as with the process. When you are passing a piece of local uh, ordinance or, or, or uh, the legislative process on the municipal level mirrors the process on the state level, which mirrors the process on the federal level, but each one has its own contours. And I'm, I'm not going to front. I, I know more about municipal and state than federal. So we're not probably going to talk about federal a lot as much as I will about state and municipal in terms of mechanics. All right. So if you have any questions, text them to me. The phone number is in the uh, description. Email me info at lewisconwayjr.com. Uh, this session is sponsored by Equally Yoked Marketing uh, and Consultants. You can go follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn on that. And yeah, if you have any questions, make sure you reach out. And if this has been helpful, somebody type a one in the comments if you think I should um, cover some, some more topics. Make sure you put that, that in the comments. And, and again, I'll try to interact with folks as I'm doing live 
but I, I, I haven't figured out how to do it on Facebook. So y'all just have to bear with me. All right. So I'll see you next week, next Wednesday, 10 p.m. Tell somebody. Make sure you follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn and all that stuff. All right. Y'all have an amazing evening and I appreciate you.